Welcome back uh, for part two of our first morning session with uh, Prof Professor Maurice Ohayan, uh, Dr. Michael Vitiello. Uh, and now we are pleased to have with us joining Justine and myself today are Jills Friedman, uh, the Chief Strategy Officer for the American Sleep Apnea Association, founder of ACOR and co-founder of Smart Patients, and Dr. Siram Parthasarathy, straight from Tucson, Arizona, uh, with the ICU, I imagine, right out the other side door. Um, where I know he has a huddle at the top of the hour. So it'll be great to get a, an update about what's going on in your backyard, Cy. And uh, let's talk about the work that we've been doing together and the work that we need to do as an organization going forward uh, under um, the guidance of, of an international uh, cross-disciplinary team. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, Adam. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I would say that uh, as was uh, earlier alluded to by Mike Vitiello, uh, different parts of the country are in different phases nice. of uh, the COVID issue. And uh, what we are seeing is, is that a clear lag between when new cases are being reported with regards to the surge, followed by when hospitalizations are happening, which is the second uh, delayed phase lag peak, so to speak. And then there's another delayed phase like peak for ICU admissions and uh, the strain on ventilators and ICUs. And then there's another delayed phase um, on when deaths happen because these all happen in a particular sequence with the patient. So it is natural. And uh, that would be such a uh, phase like search uh, peaks. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to say that uh, as a state, uh, we are plateauing um, and we hope that it continues. And of course, it's always a function of how testing is happening. We all seems like we're learning as we go, but we have been very, very fortunate. Uh, I, for one, have uh, you know learned a lot uh, from our Italian colleagues, uh, from uh, folks in South Korea, as well as in Wuhan, and especially personally for me, I've learned a lot from uh, 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 the uh, critical care leadership at the University of Washington and in uh, the. Uh, um, three major universities in New York who shared their early experiences with what are the things that they need to do to handle things. And, and that's what we were very fortunate for us to learn from them. We have a huddle um, like this in Zoom um, every Sunday evening, and a lot of the chiefs of various critical care divisions from across the country uh, get on a Zoom call. And uh, um, the shout out I'd give out is Rob Glenny at the University of Washington, who very early shared us a uh, whole range and breadth of experience and prepared us mentally and literally prepared us for what to anticipate with regards to the waves. And that really got us in a very good position for us to take on some of the challenges that we experienced because we learned from our colleagues who, by the way, took the time out of their extremely busy, crazy day to share with their colleagues across the country to whom it had not reached us yet, to share with us pearls of wisdom that is still today benefiting us. So I can't say that I'm so heartened, I mean, extremely heartened and grateful for the community um, coming together and sharing such a knowledge. So uh, I'll sh uh, just stop there with regards to the ICU. It, 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 that, that's, a, that's an amazing update. Uh, I, I, I'd follow back up on it, Sai. Is, is, are you still at the census levels that you were maybe a month or two ago when this first started, when you were really first, first starting to see cases? Or do you feel like you yeah. guys? There are three. No. There are three terminologies that have come out of this. One is, you know, the surge. Everybody knows what the surge is, right. and then there is the slow burn. And what I would like to put out there is a high plateau. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, a lot of folks who successfully flattened the curve with lockdowns and, you know, shelter-in-place orders, uh, they, they call it the slow burn. That it's going to slowly burn, continue to fester over a long period of time. And by that, they mean that the peak is not as high. Um, whereas we in Arizona, I would say at this point in time, we are in what I call a high plateau. It's not a slow burn. A slow burn means that we dropped in terms of our prevalence rates and therefore are in sort of an idle state, um, but still elevated from baseline. Whereas we went all the way up and we are now at a high plateau, um, and which is where we are. Um, and we continue to stay there and we're seeing some signs of uh, reduction statewide. Um, and uh, we take stock uh, with the consortium, statewide coordination efforts by uh, the health department uh, in the state, as well as the city's efforts. And we are seeing these curves um, as showing early signs of new cases reducing across the city. Um, and um, so we are hopeful 
that we start to drop, but right now we are not a plateau. And is that, does that go for the, the Native American, for the reservations and, and for the low SES and, and any of that as well? Um, no, you raise a very important point, I think, I mean, you focus on the cities. Uh, we forget uh, that the rural counties are, again, uh, further a little back where the spread happens. And uh, we think that uh, right now uh, it is uh, hitting, from what I hear, uh, we've had volunteers go to, uh, you know, the Navajo Nation and try to help and things of that nature and give resources and to the Indian Health Services and whatnot. And there's a lot of effort, statewide coordination effort, which is very pleasing uh, to see that such um, a community effort can come together. But at the same time, they are further face lag than the um, urban areas. The rural areas are, again, uh, in a subsequent wave. And uh, we worry because they are generally low resource, uh, resource poor areas. And we worry about what the health consequences are going to be in the rural areas. So you touch upon a very important point. And that is still a mountain to climb. Um, and it's just that everyone is climbing these mountains at different times. Yeah. And so when people are talking about opening up for regular business, in, let's say in Northern California for hospital systems, we are not in, in that state at all. Uh, we are beginning to see glimmers of that. We're planning for it, uh, but we are not done it for long. I'm sure a lot of the other... Uh esteemed uh, panelists here have uh, some questions and some thoughts and maybe want to talk about, you know, after we've heard from Dr. Vit Vitiello and, and from, from Dr. Partha Sarathi, maybe about what we as, as a patient advocacy association, uh, where the priority should now be that we're in a COVID era where, you know, we've did some amazing surveys with the FDA and, and Evidation Health in the last few years to really understand our population. Uh, but I almost think you have to almost start from scratch now that you have a whole new baseline since it looks like we're going to be in a long-term intensive confinement situation that's going to open up slowly and sporadically until we learn how to manage this uh, and get back to a new society. Yeah, I, I, I would like to follow up on some of the things that I said. First, uh, okay. thanks for the shout out to Washington. Uh, <laughs> no, but, but it speaks to one of the good things that's going on in this process. Again, if we, we can't concentrate on just the horror all the time, the cooperation that is ongoing and that is facilitated by our information technologies is unlike anything that's occurred before. And if there's one thing that is going to save us, it will be that coordination if it is used. There are, and I, I'm just going to speak to one thing that's a little off topic and that, and you can turn my camera off if you want. Uh, but if we talk about vaccines, okay, the U.S. is trying to develop vaccines. China is trying to develop vaccines. Great Britain, every country that has the technology and the will and the expertise is trying to develop tech vaccines. We don't want to assume that we're going to develop ours first and we're going to be able to use it first. We need the kind of international coordination that is already talking about, well, whoever develops a functional vaccine, how do we then turn around and employ worldwide efforts to manufacture it once it's tested and proven appropriate? And worldwide efforts to manufacture and distribute it and worldwide efforts to coordinate the funding that will allow us to do that. Because if we're going to have to inoculate three quarters of the world or more, uh, you can't wait until the vaccine is there and then start the process. The process has to begin sooner. And this unfortunately requires leadership and that has been not forthcoming from really from any of the national leaders, uh, and I'm quite shocked. May I respond to this? Please. Uh, there is a big political crisis happening today in France that touches directly to what you're saying. Sanofi is in deep trouble in France today because the CEO of the company spoke to Bloomberg yesterday and said that because there are some funding coming, public funding coming from the U.S., the U.S. will be the first country to receive the vaccine if it's successful. <laughs> and it's a major crisis in France today. 
for the right reason, where the president and the prime minister have said this is not at all acceptable. This is a global crisis. There is absolutely no reason that any specific country should receive the result of the vaccine, the first vaccines uh, as a priority. It's also good to know that about two weeks ago, there was a big meeting of the World Health Organization, plus most countries, where $9 billion were allocated to develop vaccines jointly in collaboration with one big country missing, of course, the US. The only representative of the US was the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And that says everything we need to know about what's going on here. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear, not of the crisis in France, but I'm glad to hear about the WTO efforts because that's exactly what we need. Yeah, I mean, the chairman of uh, Sanofi, who is French, responded almost immediately and said that uh, the CEO had misspoken, it's not going to happen. Yeah, so I, I would like to say that, you know, uh, to mirror uh, what Virgil and uh, Mike Vitello said, which is uh, it's only through collaboration and camaraderie can we actually surmount this uh, tsunami uh, that confronts us. And uh, God forbid there are multiple tsunamis that are await us in the future. Uh, it's very key. And what I would like to share, you know, sort of from the front lines is, is that the collaboration I saw was... Um, you know, not only uh, within, you know, across, uh, you know, the shores uh, with, you know, information coming to us early on from South Korea and Italy and, uh, and whatnot from colleagues that were there, but we also, uh, you know, got information from New York hospitals and uh, University of Washington. But I, if you brought it down further at the state level, there was such high level of coordination uh, that was happening with the State Department where, uh, Health Department, where we all got on the horse and we knew what were the, some of the resources available in one hospital versus another so that we can share that. And even I want to bring it down to some of these community hospitals in a city. Uh, they were sharing with us, uh, creating a WhatsApp group. What are some of the you know uh, things that they are doing for a disease that we have never seen like this before? It's almost like it's tailor-made to cause havoc, both in adults and in children. And some of the in innovations that they came up with, they freely shared it with us. And vice versa, we shared policies. We were writing policies literally every two days because we're changing the way mm -hmm. we're practicing critical care. That we're changing the way we're practicing pulmonary medicine. Changing what universal precautions means in terms of uh, contracting infection. And it was all freely shared with, with these uh, policies from one hospital to another so that we can actually not have to develop it ground up, but customize it to our needs. But if I brought it down further, I would say even within the institution, usually there are some differences in opinion between, let's say, a cardiology critical care and a, and a pulmonary critical care uh, person, just myself, or a trauma critical care person. And so we all have some differences in opinion about how we do things. But we put all those differences aside because we knew we had to beat this beast. We put all those differences aside and we worked hand in hand with a common goal for confronting that. One of the key uh, things I would like to say is that we take that uh, lesson, uh, you know, as a lesson learned that we will live by that lesson. That once we successfully beat this thing and we hope that we beat this thing, that we continue this level of cooperation and camaraderie because at the end of the day, it's, you know, you talk about herd immunity for vaccine and herd immunity due to contracting of infection. Uh, but uh, I want to say at the, at the end of the day, you got to stick as a herd. You go out there as a loner, you're going to get eaten up, uh, you know, because, you know by, by the lions or the predators out there. In this case, it's a, a small, tiny bug that's invisible to the naked eye in the form of coronavirus. So I want to say that I just hope, I just hope that we continue to, you know, keep this lesson that we have learned close to heart and never, never forget it. Sure. <clears throat> Sorry, as a patient advocate, there is something that really has fascinated me for the last three months. There is a real revolution that is taking place, which is that we learned about a very recent development, scientific development through those preprints. All of a sudden, instead of having to wait two, three years to see the result in a peer-reviewed publication, everything is available to all of us almost instantly, which presents both great aspects and dangerous ones. 
uh, the story of the hydroxychloroquine, I think, right. comes as the number one the classic. The classic case of the damage that can happen if people just take it at face value and don't analyze the methodologies and uh, that is underlying those preprints. But in general, I think that the positive aspects of it really uh, singularly overcome the, the problems that come also with those preprints. What do you think? Uh, that's a very, very important question. And, uh, you know, there's an editor in chief amongst us, so I'm going to uh, just take a stab, <laughs> a stab at it and then hand it off to him because I'm sure he can give you all facets of it. Uh, uh, but um, I will let him handle that question head on. But I just wanted to um, answer your question with a question. Has science taken a front stage in this crisis? I would like to say, answer that question by saying, now everybody is talking science. Everybody understands the importance of science. Science has become important for our existence. It's become existential. So I'm gonna, with that, I'm gonna do a major pass to Dr. Vitiello, who's <laughs> editor in chief. Well, I, I think the answer should be that the circumstances dictate the need. And that uh, it's all well and good to have procedures to guide our knowledge uh, under normal circumstances. But things can be expedited. Uh, that doesn't mean that everything that's peer, that's peer reviewed shouldn't be peer reviewed uh, or ultimately peer reviewed. But it does mean that if you happen to be a virologist right now, <laughs> that uh, this is the time to cut to the chase and to uh, when you think there's something important that needs to be shared to share it. And, uh, and let it be sorted out in the mix. Uh, you know, you can't, and the FDA is designed to protect us, uh, but they can also overprotect us. Uh, and so, as I said, I think that circumstances should dictate procedure, and uh, and, I, and and it should be clear. I know. I know. Justine has a question here. Go ahead, Justine. Yeah, we have a question from one of the attendees. Uh, Doug is uh, chiming in, and we had been talking before about the development of a vaccine. But can you speak a little bit to vaccine versus medicine? You know, and 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 the sure they do. Benefits. Well, I should. I'm going to let Sai do that since he's a physician. Uh, I can talk. I can talk, but I can talk about almost anything uh, if, if given the chance. Please, Sai. <laughs> Oh, I, I wanted to share, you know, in all of this, uh, you know, we, we are always looking for hope and hope is a great motivator. Hope keeps us alive. I want to say what I'm hearing is uh, the following that will answer both the question about the medicine and the vaccine, but also share with you some of the efforts that are being taken uh, by thoughtful leaders. First off, I want to say that, you know, our sort of chief science officer for the nation right now is Tony Fauci. And he brings with him the knowledge and experience. And um, many of us have seen the HIV epidemic and how it ravaged the population. And he's been at the tip of the spear when he um, entangled himself in that mix, going way back with azithromycin, AZT being the first drug to show a glimmer of hope, just like how Remdesivir is showing some glimmer of hope. So I want to say that science is in the forefront. Uh, science is in good hands with regards to direction. Now, it's the same group. Uh, with uh, Francis Collins and the NIH, who are bringing together something called the Active Network. And essentially, they are trying to bring in, you know, we talk about camaraderie and collaboration amongst uh, societies, people, uh, you know, providers and systems and whatnot. But uh, Big Pharma has decided uh, that they're going to put aside the intellectual property fights, put aside their defenses, and 10 large pharmaceutical giants are willing to manufacture outside, outside of IP any drug that is, turns out to be very promising. And so uh, NIH is coordinating with 10 major uh, uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers, all of academia, all of uh, patient advocacy groups, all of uh, these uh, 10 large pharmaceutical chains to make enough drug, choose top six winners for both medications and top six winners for vaccines so that they can start rolling out. So it's going to be research done very differently. Usually, as you alluded to earlier, uh, Jules, is that the research is done in such a fashion that 
you have to wait many years, four years, five years. Why are some of these results becoming available? Yes, there is that pre-publication that Mike Vitellio spoke to. But the other thing is, here's the future. The future is that there are going to be 500 to 2,000 sites which are supported by 10 pharmaceutical giants who can make many, many drugs, many, many vaccines. And uh, you can actually, in three months, do a study of 2,000 individuals if you have 2,000 sites or 1,000 sites and each one of them enrolls two or three patients over a three-month period and they come out the other end, in three months flat, you know whether that drug is a winner or a loser. You know, uh, with the vaccine, there's going to be a little bit more of a gestation period, not only to make them, but to do safety phase one trials before you get it out there. But we are looking at a transformation, not only of society, the way we do uh, conduct our lives and um, handshakes are forbidden and things of that nature, but this has impacted how, uh, in a positive way, how research is going to be done, where they're going to create these research platforms and they can throughput 2,000 patients into a trial in literally three months. That's unthinkable before COVID era, um, era. Uh, but now is this ship being fully built? Is this plane being fully built? No, it's being built, um, but we aren't, you know, flying it as yet. Uh, but this is public uh, information. It was spearheaded by the Doris Duke uh, Foundation, uh, bringing all of these entities together. Um, and so it's going to be um, uh, very different. And just like how telemedicine has transformed the care for sleep uh, patients with sleep disorders, um, I think this is going to transform the way research is being done. Why would you go back to a way where it takes five years for you to put 2,000 patients in? When you figured out during the COVID era, that you can actually do a 2,000 patient trial in literally three months flat. So I think this is really going to be transformative and it's paradigm shifting. So there is a weird dichotomy taking place. What you're saying is absolutely true for all the clinical trials regarding COVID-19, but for almost every other clinical trial, for any other condition, they are stuck. Nobody's conducting any <laughs> clinical trials at this point. And we are going to have to find a, uh, a balance between doing trials for COVID-19 and restarting trials for all the cancer trials and for all the other serious diseases. Yeah, that's, that's a perfect segue to one of the you know, topics of discussion. I mean, it's almost like uh, you, know, you teed, teed Adam up there uh, because I want to <laughs> <laughs> bring in you know, the concept of how you do telemedicine incorporation into research and you know, I'm pleased to say that we are, you know, doing a couple of telemedicine projects that have been chugging along, um, you know, with, without a, a, you know, a blip in the screen because our proof to us that you're not going to increase the risk of uh, contracting infection and you're benefiting patients and there's beneficence, uh, then you should continue. And, you know, and what was Sai speaking to is is an ongoing. Uh, it's been a couple of years now that he've had has an ongoing Pecori Peer Buddies, which was a train the, the trainee sort of program that he's done in his local Arizona area. And we are now talking to Pecori about how can we scale this nationally since the world has been flipped on its head overnight, and our in person awake programs are in, are at the sleep clinics. They're no longer there. Uh, so these people need to get the education, the support from us, but they also need to get it and know that we can't give it always so that we need to train our army, our, our future, uh, dare I say, registry. And, you know, that's sort of, you know, it's a perfect segue for Dr. Ohio and that, you know, this is really what we want to build is, is our sleep apnea community. So that it is diverse. It's not homogeneous. It's, it's representative of the entire country and eventually of the world. And it's multiple languages and, and it's all shapes and sizes and that we can turn around and we have the platform built. We don't re need, need to build a new platform each time to go and conduct these fast trials to get answers in, in quality of life outcomes that matter for our patients, not claims benefit, not adherence benefit, but you know, are you improving my life right now? So with that, Dr. Ohio, and, you know, you've been sitting back listening to all of us chat about this. I know you got a lot going on up there. <laughs> no, no. I, I think that uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Shai for a really uh, uh, a good uh, feedback on what research can become. And he shares that I am very sensitive to the way uh, 
that uh, we can improve our um, way to to conduct research, to do, go faster, to be published uh, probably uh, in a faster way. Presently, all the system until the COVID was a little uh, too slow, a little to be nice. It was really uh, something that could be improved. We know that the technology is there and that is like if we are rediscovering our own technology. The telemedicine was there, but it was sleeping. Uh, the, uh, the way that we can conduct clinical try more uh, uh, faster was there. We were not using. All of that was not used. The way that we do our meetings, the way that we, we can virtually uh, multiply the contact, the collaboration, is all of that is new. What I hope is that it will, it will stay uh, like that and it will uh, improve. Like Shai, I think that, uh, for example, what we do in epidemiology can be uh, improved, serving much better. For example, the big cohort of patients until COVID, nobody was interested. Epidemiology, I can tell you, in sleep, is, was practically abandoned practically abandoned. No, we have some number of prevalence, but nobody was knowing exactly what was ongoing. Presently with COVID, everyone is interested. Everyone wants to know what could happen. What are the numbers? The effect of the drugs is also on big numbers. And I suppose that we have to develop all of that. So thank you very much, Shai, for a beautiful introduction, more eloquent than mine, but I, I appreciate and really uh, um, uh, I support completely all what you, you have said. Maybe uh, also one word about uh, Michael. Michael, thank you very much to, uh, for your insight about uh, uh, COVID, about research, about your experience as a uh, uh, chief editor of uh, Sleep Medicine Review. Uh, we w have worked uh, numerous years about all of that. We know uh, the problem of uh, uh, the peer review process, mm -hmm. how much is unjust, how much we must open it also sometimes, knowing how to do, to, to go uh, uh, and to promote research and the true research that could be there and uh, on the front line. Thank I, I you know, very much. I, I know Jill wants to, to, to follow up on that as, as far as uh, the new world for research and peer-reviewed and what's published and what we have access to as the layman's in the world. Uh, I think uh, it's fair to say, Jill, before you speak, uh, we want to see everything published, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um. No, <clears throat> I just want to uh, mention a number that I think most people are not aware of. Until now, to get a drug from the moment the molecule is developed until it becomes accepted in practice, the number of years is 17. And I am sure that this COVID-19 crisis is going to totally destroy that number. We are going to see vaccines in maybe, if we're lucky, in two years, two, two and a half years. We're going to see, treat we have already seen one treatment in a few months the entire system is going to be changed. Uh, the one thing that I wanted to say as Chief Strategy Officer for the Association is that one of the best way to accelerate research is to do active collaboration between advocacy organization, groups of patients, and high quality researchers. And I am more than thrilled to see the three of you in this panel and to know that we're going to have an active collaboration with Maurice and many other people. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Justine? Yes, thank you. Uh, I have a few questions. We, uh, Dr. Said, I'm not sure if you heard in the first panel, but we kind of lobbed a, a, a softball over <laughs> to your area. We had one of the attendees um, inquiring about the discussion of CPAP machines and aerosoling and, and, um, and you know, what, what should they do? What, what should they be worried about? What's happening at home with their bed partner? Should they be taking the machine if, 
uh, if they have to go to the hospital, should they be bringing it with them? Um, can you speak just for a moment about that? Absolutely. I mean, um, one of the key things there is, is that patients do know that if they are at home, they should be using their CPAP and BiPAP. Yes, CPAP, BiPAP devices are aerosolizing. Uh, if, you could, if you could say that again, Sai, that'd be great. You got digitized, so we, we want to make sure that uh, we actually get the, the correct message out there. <laughs> sure, I apologize. Um, no way, that's not your fault. It's technology. Yeah. Uh, uh, so it is important that they continue to use the CPAP and BiPAP um, when they are at home. Yes, CPAP and BiPAP are aerosolizing, um, and uh, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine has come up with guidelines where it says that if you feel like you're suffering from symptoms, uh, so, you know, that may be uh, COVID-like, you know, which are the, essentially the CDC symptoms, which is the runny nose, uh, cold uh, symptoms, malaise, fever, cough, shortness of breath, uh, loss of uh, sense of uh, taste or smell, which has been added on along with the malaise and muscle aches, uh, flu-like symptoms uh, recently. Um, in that case, uh, they should isolate themselves in a different room where they use the BiPAP, um, uh, but not stop using it. Um, there is uh, some conversations about considerations. This is not evidence-based where it says that, well, if you don't have a separate bedroom where you can sleep in, then maybe you should stop using it. Uh, but we actually uh, don't believe that that should be done because even when you live in a household, the reason why we tell people to quarantine themselves within their homes is that the household members have already been exposed. Uh, we used to do this with uh, tuberculosis going way back in the past, and it's called the Madras method, you know, named after the city where, you know, I was born in, in India where tuberculosis was a pro, you know, significant problem. And at that time we would say, you know, if the sputum is positive, um, uh, you know, they were told to actually see them and confine themselves and we would test all the household contacts. That's because household contacts are already at risk even before this person developed the symptoms uh, in the asymptomatic incubation period, they were shedding the virus and transmitting it to their family members. So why would this person now stop using BiPAP if they don't have a you know, sleep you know, area of their own? And then what, suffer from the consequences of hypoxemia and sleep apnea uh, on top of uh, them going into COVID? Uh, to me, that you know, doesn't make sense. So I'm coming from sort of you know, the history of how we you know, how the word quarantine came into being when ships docked and, we, you know, made people stay in a quarantined area in, in, in New York. And so this is, you know, in Europe, you know, so this is how it all started. And so we should continue to do that, but we should encourage these people to use their machine, but, you know, stay at home until and get tested and, and to, you know, socially isolate themselves and quarantine themselves until the test comes back. Uh, negative. So that, that you know, is sort of an overarching, you know, a message I wanted to give. But in hospitalized patients, it's different, right? In hospitalized patients, there are new patients that are going to be coming into in and out of the hospital. Each patient comes into contact with at least 50 uh, providers, you know, it could be a respiratory therapist, a nurse, a nurse practitioner in one day, in one day. situation uh, we, 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 we might we, we might be lo losing you to the the technology gods. Uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> that's, that's okay. okay. Uh, I think that's a. Okay. I think what you're saying is 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 the benefits of using this machine. What we want to really communicate to our population is if you're on it and if you're at home, if you want to protect your immune system. I'm not a doctor, but as a layman, I could tell you that I know that by using my machine 100 percent adherently, I'm pretty sure that I have a better chance of fighting off COVID right now if I were to be uh, exposed to it. I know Justine and Jill's have one more question each. So go ahead, Justine. Uh, yeah, it, has there been any movement? Uh, this is from um, San Juanita uh, on, our, on our question board here. Has there been any movement in how sleep apnea is being diagnosed during this COVID era with, you know, in, um, in home versus sleep labs, um, you know, this movement to telemedicine that you touched on? Yeah, we're actually doing home sleep studies where just like the drive-through testing, people are coming at, through the drive-through um, and um, uh, picking up uh, machines. And then when they come back, uh, they are shown a brown paper bag where they can put the home sleep study units back again. We were 
uh, quiet only for about seven days when uh, COVID hit us, uh, I would say, in sort of the third week of March. And then by the uh, end of March, back our home sleep setting volumes um, because uh, we let it sit in a brown paper bag for three days uh, before we take it down and wipe it uh, with universal precaution. So our home sleep studies and AutoPAP uh, uh, therapeutic approaches are still ongoing. Uh, if I can go back to earlier, if my signal quality is good about the hospitalized patients, is that we actually house them in a negative pressure uh, room if they're good, uh, you know, is unknown. If it is known, um, then, you know, they're allowed to use CPAP and BiPAP. You know, we test them. Uh, we show that it's negative uh, and we allow them to use the CPAP, BiPAP. So even in hospitalized patients, and that's why testing is very important. Having test kits is very important and it's probably very important going into this mess and that we should have learned from elsewhere. And when the tsunami wave comes, you know, it actually withdraws water all of a sudden, the fish, is, uh, you know, fish are actually getting stranded on the beaches. When you see the water withdrawing, you got to run for the hills. And maybe it's an opportunity for us to, you know, do a huddle and say, what were the lessons learned? And, you know, why did we let science come in a little bit later? Uh, could we have learned from our colleagues across the pond earlier? What could we have done better? We, we, you know, we're constantly learning. So anyway, I wanted to share that, sorry to segue, but the home sleep studies are still ongoing. And now we are trying to come up with a testing paradigm for us to bring patients back into the CPAP. And that concludes our presentation of the future of sleep apnea research and advocacy in the COVID-19 era. We'd like to thank our panelists, Maurice O'Hayan, Michael V. Vitiello, Jill Friedman, and Syram Parthasarathy. A presentation from Jazz Pharmaceuticals will begin in a moment. Stay with us. <laughs>